Dan Chase used to work for the CIA but left and is now living off the grid. Then, a hitman tries to get rid of him and Chase realizes he has to deal with his past to be safe. The FBI, led by Harold Harper, is after him due to their complicated history. Chase is harder to catch than expected, so a super-skilled person is sent to grab him. While on the run, Chase stays with Zoe McDonald, who faces unexpected challenges when she finds out the truth about him. Then Chase lives with his two dogs, Dave and Carol. He often sees visions of his late wife, Abby, who passed away a few years ago from Huntington's disease. Abby's tough times used to keep Dan awake at night, and he feels overwhelmed, having lost the woman he deeply loved. Dan also has a daughter named Emily, but she lives out of town, and her exact location is unknown. The presence of his dogs and the memories of his wife shape Dan's daily life. Dan often does things that show he likes to stay hidden, like microwaving his phone and hiding guns and money under the floor. One day, after going to the doctor, he sees a bald man in a coffee shop. There's no clear sign that the man is connected to Dan, but because of his past life, Dan is always careful about potential threats. He checks the garbage and sets up a line of empty cans as a precaution. Sleeping with a flashlight and his gun nearby, Dan hears the cans rustle and he wakes up with a start. The dogs on the bed jump off and head downstairs, sensing something is up. In the shadows, Dan spots the same man from the coffee shop. The dogs help him deal with the intruder and Dan shoots the guy. To make it look fair for the police, he uses the man's gun to shoot twice randomly at the roof. After this intense encounter, Dan decides to leave town and calls his daughter, Emily, to update her on the situation. Meanwhile, we get a glimpse of FBI Assistant Director Harold Harper, who is spending time with his grandson, building Lego structures. Their conversation reveals that the boy's parents have passed away. While still feeling sad, Harold cries in the bathroom when his wife hands him the phone. Agent Raymond Waters calls, saying Bob Blasky redirected him to Harold. There's an old case from 1987 near Torquem about someone missing, Dan. Waters needs to find out if Dan's alive and, if so, bring him in. Harold insists the case is closed. Right away, it's clear he doesn't want these files opened again. His actions suggest there's more to the story, maybe something not good, that he wants to keep secret. Dan, trying to stay ahead of those chasing him, stops at a diner, thinking he's got enough distance from the men on his tail. After making a call to someone to ready the house for him, we get a glimpse of a flashback. Younger Dan and Abby talk about the idea of settling down and having a home, but this conversation happens after some kind of incident. There's a lingering question about Mrs. Dixon that remains unanswered. Dan brings it up during the phone call with the man, who is still a bit of a mystery to us. Could Mrs. Dixon be Dan's real name? It seems like Abby and Dan had to change their names, get new identities, and disappear to stay hidden. Here's the twist. Harold knew Dan was alive even before Waters called, suggesting some kind of deal between them for mutual benefits. Harold tips off Dan about a transponder the bald man planted on his car to track him. The FBI, with its top specialists and highly trained folks, is closing in within three minutes. Faraz Hamzad, someone from Dan's past, wants to meet him. But there's a catch as Harold warns. Dan has to say a permanent goodbye to his daughter, Emily, or else she'll be in danger. Heartbroken and flustered, Dan makes the tough call. Emily, angry and confused, can't do anything about it. In a surprising move, Dan manages to shake off his pursuers, tossing the tracking device onto the road. Waters instructs the agents to search the area, but the elusive old man slips away once again. Out of nowhere, Dan emerges from the darkness, crashing his car into theirs and taking down one of the agents. However, the remaining agent manages to subdue him. In a clever twist, Dan, with his seat belt on, crashes the car again, thwarting the agent's attempts to fight back. The dogs, Dave and Carol, play a crucial role in helping Dan escape while leaving the agent behind. The episode concludes with a chilling warning from Dan to Harper, send more men my way and they'll come back in bags. Send anyone after my daughter and they'll come back in pieces. In a flashback, we see Harold in a flustered state, standing in a desert between 1979 and 1989 during the Afghanistan-Soviet War. He's waiting for Dan, whom he calls Johnny. Dan arrives in style, riding on a horse. Dan asks, did you bring them? Referring to guns for Afghan revolutionaries fighting for Hamzat. However, Harold disappoints him with a no. Despite his inability to provide the weapons, Dan's conviction to help the cause is unwavering. During this conversation, Harold warns Dan that if the knowledge of this transaction becomes public, he'll have to come after him on the government's orders. The flashback sheds light on the complexities of their past, revealing a connection rooted in a tumultuous time. In the present, Harold surveys the area where Dan left the bodies and Waters is still hot on his trail. This ongoing conflict could turn into a strategic advantage for Dan, who seems poised to capitalize on it. Dan abandons his battered car and gets a new one, heading to Collier Seville, Pennsylvania. 
The plot thickens with the introduction of a seemingly important character, Zoe. She's a widower and Dan's next-door neighbor. When Dave and Carol, Dan's dogs, join him to meet Zoe, she bluntly asks Peter Caldwell to vacate the apartment because of her strict no-pets policy. This sets the stage for potential conflicts and interactions in Dan's new environment. In the FBI office, we meet Agent Angela, Harold's protege. Harold assigns her the task of finding Dan's daughter, Emily, a detail he was unaware of until Dan inadvertently revealed it during their conversation. The plot thickens with the introduction of Morgan Boat, a person of considerable resources and influence, someone not to be trifled with. Boat was once a mentor to both Dan and Harold, warning them multiple times about getting involved with Hamzad. Now, their past decisions are coming back to haunt them. A phone number sits on Harold's desk, and until he picks up the note, he has the choice to either use or not use the services it offers. Bo cautions Harold, emphasizing that he is fighting for his life, a life Dan has the power to obliterate in an instant. In a final try, Dan cooks scrambled eggs for Zoe, just like her mom used to when she fell down. Surprisingly, it works, and Zoe lets him stay. The connection grows as Zoe invites Dan to dinner. Their first date gets a bit weird as they discuss the medicines they take, but they take pride in it. They also talk about their past partners. Zoe's story stands out because she paints herself as the victim and her ex as the bad guy, even if it's not the whole truth. The scene mixes humor and depth, making the state quite different from the usual ones. After many years of marriage, Zoe still struggled to find happiness in her choices. Her ex tried to help, but in the end, he decided to seek happiness in his own way. Zoe's story is intriguing and somewhat self-reflective, making her a more interesting character than a typical love interest. Meanwhile, Waters tries to convince Angela about Zoe, shedding light on Hamzad's background and his connection to Dan and Harold. Waters recounts a story about the Babakor Kor, a legendary beast that consumed everything, taken from Afghan folklore. Despite no confirmation, it strongly hints at Dan being the mysterious figure. In the war against the Soviets and other revolutionary groups, Dan was Hamzad's right-hand man, showcasing his influence and capabilities. The narrative unfolds, weaving together the characters' pasts and adding layers to the unfolding mystery. Dan's connection with Hamzad makes Hamzad seem unbeatable. No surprise, the CIA's Islamabad station chief at the time was Harold. The playful talk between Langley and Quantico gets serious as Waters warns Angela about people who think they can't be influenced. Zoe's relationship with her son is tricky. He calls during their drive asking about college fees. Things get intense when they encounter a police roadblock. Dan quickly disguises his bruises and adds reading glasses. The tension grows as they're asked to step out of the car. When Zoe seems unsure, Dan senses danger. In a shocking twist, he kills the officers and urges Zoe to get in. When she hesitates, he shoots her too. The story takes unexpected turns, keeping the suspense high. The daydream or bad dream stops when Zoe tells Dan to get back in the car and go. She invites him in for coffee, and even though he's unsure due to his wandering lifestyle, he agrees. However, thoughts of Abby still bother him. In a dream, Abby teases him, saying he's scared to move on and find a new partner. She challenges him about whether he'd tell the truth or if she would. The dream gets interesting as Abby seems to go to Zoe's side of the bed. The next morning, Dan decides it's time to leave. When he tries to say goodbye, Zoe is upset. Her son couldn't take exams because her ex-husband messed up the tuition check to avoid paying alimony. Even though Dan offers to help with tuition, Zoe says no and he quietly starts making scrambled eggs. The story gets emotional, showing the complications in the characters' lives and relationships. Harold jokes with Angela at her desk about her dedication to work. In the middle of their talk, an officer shares the surprising news that Dan's daughter, Emily, took her own life in 2003. Harold is left shocked by this information. Angela then asks Harold about Waters' info and he mysteriously says, you're seeing the end of a very long story that no one has any answers for, leaving her confused. The man mentioned in Boat's note is Julian, someone we only hear about. Harold decides to use his services. The officers report the stop details to the FBI office and now Harold knows exactly where Chase is. He gives Julian the address, warning that Chase is dangerous and would do anything to protect himself. Julian seems to be a character similar to Chase, a tough person focused on keeping themselves safe. The unfolding events add more mystery and suspense to the developing story. Harold's disbelief at Boat's contingency offer suggests that Boat is a high-level operative. It sets the stage for an intriguing showdown between the two. Get ready for some intense action, more broken and bruised ribs might be in store for the old man. The unfolding dynamics promise an engaging and suspenseful turn in the story. Julian is seen at a bus stop when Harold calls him. He helps a woman in crutches onto the bus and is overheard talking to his mother on the phone before talking to Harold. In a flashback, we witness Dan's first meeting with Faraz. 
The storyteller's dedication to giving the story a well-rounded feel by blending present and past scenes is commendable. The flashback reveals Hamzad's suspicion of Dan. Although Dan wins him over with plans to help in the war against the Soviets, Hamzad puts him to another test, his wife. Enter Abby Chase, surprising both Hamzad and Dan. This twist sheds light on why Hamzad might hold a grudge against Dan. The complexities of rebellious love claim another victim in the vast world of storytelling. Back at Zoe's place, things are getting tense. Dan has a feeling that Zoe could be a trustworthy ally, so he tries to share his side of the story and the truth with her. However, the more Dan talks, the less convinced and more terrified Zoe becomes. She gives Dan a chance to leave before she returns, threatening to call the cops if he stays. It's easy to imagine how someone in Zoe's position would react in real life. When you believe you've found the perfect partner and then discover shocking truths, it can be heartbreaking. Despite this, Zoe unleashes Dan's dogs when she sees him struggling with another man, Julian. The dogs come to Dan's rescue, pinning Julian down while Dan shoots him. In a stylish sequence, he also takes down the CIA's surveillance drone in a bid to regain control of the situation. The intense and suspenseful events keep the audience on the edge of their seats. In flashbacks, we witness young Dan attempting to persuade Abby about his motivations. She is the final hurdle he needs to overcome to assist Hamzad, but she remains unconvinced. Abby's skepticism towards Dan reflects a broader perspective shared by many in war-torn nations against the U.S. The nation's checkered history of providing weapons and supporting factions in wars is well documented. Abby's past experiences intensify this viewpoint, revealing how her perception of Americans shifted from the hopeful faces depicted in the University of Ohio pamphlets to the reality of grunts and sophisticated CIA bureaucrats. In her eyes, Americans fall into two categories, the self-destructively naive, willing to commit to any cause for improvement, and the pragmatic monsters who justify any violence. At present, Abby struggles to determine which side Dan aligns with, adding a layer of complexity to their relationship. A conflict between the FBI and the CIA has erupted, leading to tensions between agents from both agencies. Harold and Angela suspect Waters of being aligned with Hamzad, deliberately causing disruptions and undermining the FBI's investigation for his own purposes. Despite Waters' attempts to deny these allegations, Harper dismisses his denials and discloses the true reason behind Hamzad's current revenge spree. In a major revelation, Angela is unveiled as Emily Chase, Dan's daughter. She has been quietly working to assist her father all while keeping her true identity hidden from him. This revelation dramatically shifts the dynamics, introducing a kind of triple agent behind enemy lines. Angela steps into the conversation between Harold and Waters, urging them to leave the reasons behind Hamzad's actions to him. Alia Shokat skillfully portrays the internal conflict within her character as she navigates the delicate relationships with both her father figures, trying to prevent them from falling apart. The very last scene leaves us with limited information except that Zoe is seemingly taken under Dan's protection, perhaps against her will. The situation appears cynical, but that's the current reality. Julian is nowhere to be found, and the CIA has the couple's location. Zoe, looking scared, comes out of the back of Dan's car. Dan, standing nearby, tells her to call her son Jason, assuring him that she's okay. He also asks her to warn Jason when the FBI comes to his house. Even though the situation is tense, Dan stays calm. He seems to care about Zoe and wants to comfort her. This is the last call Zoe makes from her phone. They managed to escape from the FBI, and now they've been missing for more than three days. Angela, secretly Emily, plays with Harold's grandson while discussing the case. Harold notices Angela's intense focus on Dan's wife, which sets her apart in the investigation. However, Angela skillfully defends her involvement. Emily calls her father and learns about his current plans. They are in Colorado but will soon move to L.A. Dan has an investment company in L.A., and the real reason for the move is to draw attention to Hamzad. The plan is to attract someone else with a grudge against Hamzad and let them confront him. Dan also reassures Angela about her mother's situation and the complex relationship involving Dan and Hamzad. He warns Emily to stay away and avoid putting herself in danger, even if it's for her own mother. The company Dan plans to use is called Corsair Finance, and he will adopt the identity of Henry Dixon, while Zoe will be known as Marcia Dixon. Stewart helps arrange an apartment for them, and Dan is set to meet with Zachary, the investment officer for the fund, to discuss the issue. A crucial flashback unveils why Abby chose Dan over Hamzad. The incident involves retaliation from Hamzad's camp against Russian soldiers, highlighting the difference in their approaches to justice, Hamzad's vengeful perspective versus Dan's more compassionate choice. Hamzad's sister was cautious of Dan, who went by Johnny Kohler back then. Julian, now back in his front-end employment disguise, discusses the incident involving Dan with his partner. 
he encourages Julian to contact the man who assigned him the task, Harold. Over the phone, the assistant director is stunned when Julian suggests that there might be a mole in his team. When he visited Dan's place, Chase seemed ready to vanish without a trace. He would have done so only if he had received prior notice of someone coming. Although Harold doesn't say it, we can see in his eyes that Angela is on his mind. Along with Angela and Waters, he then meets Nina Kruger, Hamzad's confidant and lawyer. Nina is cautious with her words about Hamzad's intentions, but Harold takes a shot in the dark. In a significant moment of the series, Harold indirectly reveals to Angela secrets about Dan that he didn't share with her before. Harold cleverly deals with both Hamzad and Dan at the same time, using their similarities to his advantage. The story explores this delicate balance, making it more intriguing. Nina sets up another meeting with Harold and his team after his revealing statements. Zoe realizes she's enjoying the lifestyle and starts planning a way to turn things around on Dan when he comes back. There's a mysterious plan in the works, and we'll learn more about it soon. Dan expresses interest in investing in a company called Arlson Mining and Metallurgy, surprising Zachary with his determination. When asked why, Dan reveals he wants to use the company's owner, Suleiman Pavlovich, to settle a score with Hamzad. Suleiman is the Russian guy Dan freed when Hamzad wanted him dead. Now, Dan wants to use Suleiman to get back at Hamzad. Nina sets up a meeting and invites Harold on a private plane to meet with Hamzad. Angela has to join, but Dan doesn't want her to. Angela herself is torn about going, struggling to distinguish between her roles as Emily and Angela. Both Emily and Angela are seeking answers in their own ways, leading them down potentially dangerous paths. Dan returns home, and Zoe, seemingly more willing to play along, has prepared dinner. However, she has secretly set up a letter to be sent to the Corsair Finance Board. In the letter, Marcia seeks a divorce from Henry or Dan, aiming for leverage. The power balance is now more equal, possibly even a bit tilted against Dan. Zoe is finally making strategic moves, realizing she doesn't owe anything to please Dan. Her focus is on self-preservation, and by making this move, she's securing her own life. Dan's top priority is his own survival, and he's willing to do anything, even causing irreparable damage. We've seen Dan consider extreme measures, including contemplating harming Zoe, all because of a routine police stop. His paranoia is evident, and Zoe has wisely created a safety net for herself. Demanding half of what Dan owns adds a touch of reality to the role she's playing as Marcia. While we witnessed the moment Harper realized Angela was the mole and Dan's daughter, it's now officially confirmed. In the plane, heading to an unknown destination, Angela and Harper finally have a confrontation. Angela makes a joke, breaking the tension. However, Harper feels deceived and expresses that she no longer feels like family. Angela tries to reassure him that she is still the same person. Her conflicted feelings have made it challenging for Angela to be fair to both Harper and Dan, her fathers. The uncertainty lingers about what each will do, keeping the audience on edge. In the Afghanistan flashbacks, a silhouette of the older Abby is seen conversing with Dan about Zoe in the present. We shift to the dinner scene in the present, where Dan surprisingly remains unaffected by Zoe's demands. He calmly accepts them and explains why. His ultimate priority has always been the safety of his family and money holds no value if he cannot ensure their well-being. Dan reveals that Emily is in danger and he must leave to make sure she is okay. His destination is Morocco. Zoe agrees to accompany him. In the flashback, Hamzad and his sister are still working on breaking Pavlovich, confident of succeeding in the next couple of sessions. However, Abby pulls Dan aside and warns him of the potential consequences. She confesses that she has been spying for Hamzad within the Soviet troops. If Pavlovich recognizes her, he will immediately expose her collaboration with the Soviets to Hamzad. Abby, also known as Bell Hour, provides a responsible and logical explanation for her actions. She envisions a power vacuum in the region once the Soviets depart and she believes that Hamzad should be the one to fill that void and lead the country forward. However, she chooses not to reveal this to Hamzad. A few months earlier, she learned from a local tribal leader's wife about a foreign-speaking man, a Greek pirate, searching for something in the hills. The Soviets observed a prospecting crew discovering a mineral deposit of unimaginable value. Abby refrains from disclosing the location of this valuable mineral deposit to Hamzad or anyone else. She believes that possessing such power can corrupt a person, leading them to dark places from which they may never return. Hamzad is still after Dan because of the valuable information Abby knew. Zoe is uncertain about playing the role Dan suggested. On the plane, Angela is upset with Harper for revealing a personal detail about her mother. This scene meant a lot to her and Shokat's acting was impressive. Harper poses a bigger question, what identity will she choose? In a sad moment, Dan leaves his loyal Rottweilers Dave and Carol at a pet care facility, entrusting the task of getting them back to Dixon. 
Waters gets a call from Morgan Boat instructing him to do whatever Boat wants without questions. Waters is to be part of a team to retrieve Harold Harper. Julian joins Boat in the parlor where the old man sincerely tries to explain that what happened in Dan's case was not his mistake. Julian confesses that he planted the mole in Harper's team, claiming he did it like a good father would do. Dan and Zoe visit Zachary's house where Zoe convinces him to agree to their plan. Meanwhile, Dan experiences another vision of Abby unable to make peace with her passing. He holds on to her memory, keeping her prisoner in his thoughts. Zoe returns with a smile, indicating success in convincing Zachary. Harper and Angela land in North Africa where Hamzad has tasked Harper with finding the manifest of the plane Dan and Abby used to escape in April 1987. Hamzad is aware of the details as he orchestrated the exfiltration of his assets. Despite obtaining the details, Nina claims it's not sufficient. Her team plans to release a memorandum exposing Harper's guilt of completely ruining his life. Angela refuses to give up. She suggests killing Hamzad and then creating a narrative that clears Harper's name. Meanwhile, Zoe and Dan have a meaningful conversation. Zoe expresses her understanding of Dan's struggles, emphasizing that he is more than just a defender. She sees the human and caring side of him, serving as the partner he needs to connect with after work. If you want the continuation of the series, we will display it on the screen in front of you. See you there.